So, good morning, everybody. Um, on behalf of Falling Walls and the Else Gröner Fresenius Stiftung, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Symposium for Breakthroughs in Life Science. The Else Gröner Fresenius Stiftung, short EKFS, funds medical research and scientific exchange. And um, this is why it supports today's symposium. The symposium brings together the winners of the Falling, Life, si Falling Walls Life Science Call 2023. We are very happy and honored that we are not only funding the symposium, but that we, are, that we were also asked to give our input to the program design. So the, as you might have noticed, the range of today's topics is impressive. To, know, to name only a few of them, um, they range from enhancing crops to mimicking photosynthesis to the fight against malaria or tuberculosis and other diseases. Together with falling walls, we came up with a common thread for all these very diverse topics. It's all about breakthrough technologies in life science, diseases of worldwide significance, and how they might influence each other. Just allow me to highlight uh, two of the speakers. First, there is the Falling Walls Breakthrough of the Year in the category Life Sciences, um, which is Chuan He from Chicago, um, who will give the keynote on breakthrough te technologies in the afternoon. He will talk on, on RNA methylation and the regulation of gene expression. The other keynote on diseases will be given by Akiko Iwasaki. Um, Akiko Iwasaki from Yale was, aw was awarded with the Else Gröner Fresenius Prize for Medical Research 2023. For those who don't know this prize, um, it comes with 2.5 million euros and honors highly ranked researchers whose work might uh, yield path-breaking findings in the future. So Akiko has received this prize for her work in the field of infection biology and long COVID. Unfortunately, Akiko could not travel to Falling Walls. She couldn't come to Berlin due to a corona infection. Together, we decided that she will remotely give her talk in the afternoon. So we would like to draw your attention to a change in the program. The sessions at 11 a.m. and 2 p.m. have swapped. You find the updated program in the, uh, on your seats in the maps. So sorry for this, or sorry for any inconvenience. And thank you very much for your understanding. Most importantly, we send our best wishes for a full recovery to Akiko. So there are two more things that I have to say. First, let me introduce uh, our moderator for the day, Alison Abbott. I guess uh, many of you have at least already heard her name. Alison is a well-known freelance science journalist. She worked at the journal Nature for more than 20 years, almost 30 years, as I yesterday learned. And among other distinctions, she has been named the European Science Journalist of the Year 2019. We are very happy to have such a proven expert and great person as our moderator today. Thank you. So, second, this is uh, the perfect time to thank, say thank you, not only to Alison as moderator, but say thank you to all the speakers who followed our invitation and who will make this a really great event we are looking forward to. Um, and a very big thank you to all the people at Radial System and Falling Walls who are working literally behind the walls, as I see here, uh, and are running this event and making all this possible. With re this regard, special thanks go to Zoe Schütte, Nathan Heidak, and Matti Baumann, who perfectly organized the symposium. So with this, I hand over to Alison and just say have fun and an exciting day. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Alex, and good morning to everybody. It's a great privilege for me to be able to moderate this session, which I think is going to be extremely interesting. And I think, in one way, this whole three-day event is about how science can serve society. But I think that particularly, that's particularly noticeable in this symposium, which is talking about globally significant diseases and what we can do about it. And I think um, there's the only point that I would make that's relevant, I think, is the 
I think to, to note in advance the distribution of these diseases. So in the high income countries, only one of the top 10, the top 10 leading deaths is by a communicable disease. And in low income countries, the figure is six out of the 10 leading um, diseases. And this shows that science really isn't serving society in an equitable way. Um, but anyway, as Alex said, this session is bringing together the, the falling walls science winners in the life science categories. And we're going to hear about, in the morning, we're going to hear about the breakthroughs in the, um, the handling or the understanding of these globally significant diseases. And with the exception of Akiko, whose session has been changed, uh, in the afternoon, we're going to hear about breakthroughs in biological technologies. And at the end of the day, we're going to have a podium discussion which just thinks about how these uh, new technologies could actually help with developing medical interventions for the diseases that, uh, that we're concerned with. And again, this is the point where we'll be able to talk perhaps a little bit about the equity and ethics involved. So we, we're on a very short time limit. I see I'm down to 10 seconds. So let me just call the next two speakers, the first two speakers onto stage, please. And this is Peter Crompton and Mark Dewey. Can I invite you? Thanks. So our first speaker is Peter, Peter Crompton from the NIH, who's been involved in tropical diseases since he was born, I think he told me, or since his training at least. And he, <clears throat> he's been involved in partnering and developing cohorts in Mali that are collecting data on molecular and immunological uh, responses to parasitic infections. And of more recent years, he's been involved in developing clinical trials using you know, partly in Mali, taking advantage of his epidemi epidemiological knowledge. The new thing that he is talking about is monoclonal antibodies for malaria. So please, Peter. Okay, thank you, Alison. Guten Morgen. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, kick off this wonderful symposium. I look forward to learning about the exciting breakthroughs in life science from my colleagues today. Um, <clears throat> My colleague Robert Cedar and I uh, would like to thank the Falling Walls organization for this honor um, and for the opportunity to present our work on monoclonal antibodies uh, for malaria prevention. Um, so I'll just uh, remind you that malaria remains a formidable global public health threat. Uh, each year there are over 200 million cases of malaria resulting in over 600,000 deaths. Uh, the vast majority of which occur among uh, young children in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, in addition, approximately 13 million pregnant women are exposed to malaria each year, uh, resulting in substantial uh, maternal, fetal, um, and infant morbidity and mortality. Now, among the five uh, plasmodium species that infect humans, falciparum is the most common and the most uh, lethal uh, and the most prevalent in Africa. Um, unfortunately, the progress we had been seeing since the turn of the century uh, that coincided with the scale-up of malaria control interventions in reducing the number of cases and deaths, that progress has stalled uh, in recent years. And so there's a broad consensus that new tools are needed if we are to succeed in combating uh, this devastating um, ancient disease. Um, so I'll just remind you that the infection begins when Anopheles mosquitoes uh, inject anywhere from 10 to 100 uh, sporozoites uh, into the skin and blood. Uh, within minutes to hours, these find their way to the liver where they invade hepatocytes, they replicate and they differentiate into the blood stage that then exits the liver to begin a 48-hour cycle of erythrocyte invasion, replication, rupture, and reinvasion, leading to a very rapid exponential expansion in the number of parasites in the blood which, as you can imagine, uh, causes disease <clears throat> and potentially death uh, over the course of days. 
Um, a small percentage of these blood stage parasites differentiate into the sexual stage gametocytes, which are then taken up by the mosquito uh, to continue the, the life cycle. Um, so what are our current tools to control malaria? Um, they include insecticide-based uh, mosquito control in the form of bed nets and spraying insecticides on the walls of homes. The major issue here is the emergence and spread of drug-resistant, uh, I'm sorry, insecticide-resistant mosquitoes. Um, an exciting milestone recently was the, uh, the endorsement by the WHO of two malaria vaccines, the RTSS and R21 vaccines. Uh, an exciting uh, advance, but broad recognition that these are first-generation vaccines that are limited in their efficacy, the duration of their efficacy, and the age dependency of, of their efficacy. Um, a mainstay of malaria control is early diagnosis and treatment of the blood stage <clears throat> with rapid diagnostic tests and artemis and in combination therapies. Um, the, the major concern here, again, is the emergence and spread of drug-resistant parasites across Africa. Uh, and finally, the WHO recommends chemo prevention for high-risk populations such as pregnant women uh, and infants. The problem here, again, being drug-resistant parasites and the difficulty of implementing frequent uh, up to monthly dosing regimens. Uh, and so new drugs, including monoclonal antibodies um, that prevent malaria for up to six months after a single dose could improve malaria prevention coverage in these vulnerable populations. Uh, and so monoclonal antibodies uh, that are engineered to have an extended half-life um, that target the sporozoite stage are a potential new tool for malaria prevention uh, in these high-risk populations. Uh, among the advantages of targeting sporozoites is their small number, so this represents a, a bottleneck in the parasite life cycle. Importantly, they also don't replicate, and so we don't expect escape mutants to arise under the pressure of a monoclonal antibody uh, in vivo, unlike uh, a virus uh, infection, for example. And of course, blocking infection at this early stage prevents not only the disease, uh, but also the onward transmission to mosquitoes and, and other people. <clears throat> and so the antibodies I'll be discussing today target the circumsporozoite protein. This is the most abundant protein on the surface of the sporozoite. Uh, and it's required for uh, sporozoite motility and invasion of uh, hepatocytes. This is a schematic of the protein uh, showing the N-terminal, C-terminal region and a central repeat region. And it's, and it's worth pointing out that the, the two vaccines that I mentioned earlier are a truncated form of, of this protein. And you'll see in a moment why uh, the omission of this N-terminal region might be important. Um, so CIS-43LS is a first-generation monoclonal antibody for malaria prevention in humans. It was isolated from a volunteer who had been immunized with an irradiated sporozoite vaccine by my uh, colleague Bob Cedar uh, at the NIH. Um, this antibody binds uh, to this so-called junctional region uh, in between the repeat region and the N-terminal region. This is a highly conserved epitope uh, that is critical for the sporozoite's ability to invade uh, liver cells. Um, the antibody was modified in its FC region uh, with two amino acid substitutions to extend its half-life. Um, and a phase one study uh, showed that nine of nine uh, individuals who received this antibody were protected from infection in a controlled uh, clinical setting in the U.S. And so the key question, of course, is whether a monoclonal antibody could prevent uh, infection in an endemic area. And so to address that question, uh, we uh, collaborated with our uh, longstanding uh, uh, colleagues, or, or colleagues with whom we've been collaborating for quite some time in Mali at the University of Bamako uh, to conduct this trial. Um, and we're just going to zoom in here on the, um, the study site where this trial was conducted, Khalifa Bugu, uh, Mali. Um, we've been, uh, as Allison said, we've been conducting observational studies here of malaria epidemiology and immunology and parasitology for many years uh, in collaboration with our colleagues at the University of Bamako. We have a research clinic uh, staffed 24-7 to diagnose and treat malaria. And for those uh, soccer fans, this is a soccer pitch right here 
where I've embarrassed myself on many occasions playing soccer with the kids in the village, um, but it seems to make them laugh for some reason. Um, so what, what does malaria look like in Khalifa Bugu, Mali? Um, and this is really representative of what malaria looks like across the Sahel region of Sub-Saharan Africa, where transmission is very seasonal. So this histogram shows the number of febrile malaria cases um, per month since 2011 in a cohort of over 1,100 individuals. And the obvious pattern here is this very predictable and sharply demarcated six-month malaria season that coincides with the rainy season. So if we zoom in on just one of these seasons and look at the risk of infection um, shown here, if we start with an uninfected uh, cohort before the season, and every two, we two weeks we look for the appearance of blood stage parasites by PCR in the blood uh, in an age stratified fashion, you can see that over the six month malaria season, nearly everyone becomes infected. So very intense transmission. And these infections occur uh, independent of age. And so all ages are at risk of becoming infected. Adults uh, have acquired some immunity that prevents severe illness, but they are susceptible to infection. And so the simple question we had with this trial was could we take the risk of infection in adults from here by giving them a monoclonal antibody before the season uh, to something lower. Uh, and so 330 healthy adults were enrolled during the dry season. Uh, they were given an antimalarial drug at enrollment to clear any baseline infection. They were then randomized to receive uh, a single dose of normal saline placebo, uh, 10 mg per kg of CIS-43LS or 40 mg per kg. Um, and then every two weeks for six months, we looked for the appearance of blood stage parasites through a finger prick uh, blood draw. Um, <clears throat> remarkably, over 93% of uh, participants completed the six-month follow-up. Baseline characteristics were similar across study arms. The antibody was very well tolerated, and there were no uh, evident safety concerns. Uh, so this is the efficacy result, and as predicted, uh, over the course of the six-month malaria season, 78.2% of participants who received placebo became infected. And we found that the efficacy of the low dose, 10 milligrams per kilogram, compared to placebo was 75%, and efficacy of the high dose, 88.2%. Um, um, so uh, this figure shows the serum concentration of the antibody in individuals who received the high dose in red, the low dose in blue over the six-month malaria season. Uh, this is a very characteristic uh, pharmacokinetic profile um, showing uh, of a, after an intravenous infusion of a monoclonal antibody showing the immediate uh, maximum concentration, an early distributive phase as the antibody equilibrates between the circulation and the interstitial space, and then a more protracted elimination phase. Um, we observed dose linearity and the half-life of this antibody with the, uh, with the um, engineered uh, extension in the FC region was 60 days. Uh, so we then estimated the daily concentration of CIS-43LS over the study uh, period to develop a pharmacodynamic model to understand the relationship between the level of the antibody and infection risk. <clears throat> and the result of that analysis shown here on the y-axis is the probability of infection. Uh, on the x-axis, the uh, serum concentration of the antibody. And you can see that the risk of infection remains below 5% over a broad range of antibody concentrations, from 600 micrograms per ml down to less than 100 micrograms per ml, where the inflection uh, occurs. Uh, and you can see that a, a concentration of about 20 micrograms per ml corresponds to a probability of infection of less than, less than 10%. Uh, and remarkably, this is uh, very similar to what we observed in the phase one trial in the US under a controlled infection setting where 22.5 micrograms per ml corresponded to a probability of infection of less than 10%. Uh, like any study, this trial had limitations. It only included adults, so clearly we need tr trials in the target population of children and pregnant women across diverse transmission settings. And the antibodies uh, was administered intravenously, which is not a practical approach in sub-Saharan Africa. So more potent monoclonals are needed 
to enable low-dose subcutaneous uh, administration to children and also to reduce cost. So to that end, uh, L9LS is a second-generation antibody that was also isolated from a volunteer immunized with irradiated sporozoites. It binds to a similar uh, junctional epitope on the CSP protein. It was also modified to increase its half-life, but importantly, it was three times more potent than the first antibody in preclinical models. And a phase one study showed that 15 of 17 individuals were protected from controlled infection in the US, four of five who received a low dose subcutaneously of five milligrams per kilogram. So on the basis of that, uh, last year we started uh, two new phase two trials, um, one in Mali targeting uh, children six to 10 years of age who are exposed to seasonal transmission. And the question here is whether a single subcutaneous dose will protect these children over the six month malaria season. And then in Kenya, um, a trial targeting younger uh, children, uh, infants five months up to five years of age who are exposed to year-round transmission in Western Kenya. The question here being whether uh, one or two doses given at month zero and month six will protect these children over 12 months. <clears throat> and so, um, just to wrap up, the key features of monoclonals that could complement our existing tools uh, High-level protection against infection, as I said, would prevent both uh, clinical malaria and onward transmission. Uh, a single dose provides rapid protection for a predictable time period. We expect efficacy against all parasite strains, as this antibody is targeting a conserved region. Uh, and we expect efficacy to be independent of age and prior malaria exposure, which has been a challenge for malaria vaccines. And finally, we expect uh, safety across all ages, and in particular in pregnant women, uh, given the, the uh, general uh, excellent safety profile of monoclonals uh, for other diseases. And so we're considering using monoclonals uh, first and foremost for the prevention of malaria in infants and children, either with a single dose before seasonal transmission, once or twice yearly dosing uh, during perennial transmission, uh, malaria prevention in pregnancy, uh, and the other use cases shown here. Um, so in conclusion, uh, CIS-43LS was safe and efficacious against falciparum infection in adults in Mali, uh, providing for the first time proof of principle that an antibody can prevent infection. Uh, results of the phase two trials that I mentioned of L9LS in children will be available uh, in 2024. Uh, we're planning a phase three trial in children for 2026, a phase one trial in pregnancy next year, and of course, work is ongoing uh, in, in my lab, in Bob Cedar's lab, um, and colleagues around the world to find more potent monoclonal antibodies, which would further uh, reduce the dose required and, and therefore the cost. So I will end there and just quickly thank, first and foremost, the study volunteers in Mali and Kenya who uh, generously participate in these studies. The wonderful team in Mali uh, that I've worked with now for over 15 years, led by my friend and colleague, Kasum Kain Tao, uh, the hardworking folks in my laboratory, as I said, uh, my colleague and close collaborator on this project, Robert Cedar, and his team at the NIH, uh, and our colleagues at the CDC Kemri uh, in Kenya, and, and other colleagues at Harvard and University of Washington. Uh, the study uh, was funded by the NIH in Mali and Kenya, and the Kenya trial in part by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So thank you for your attention. Uh, thanks so much. Thanks so much, Peter. That's a really, really interesting new approach. And the one thing that struck me immediately, and I'm, I'm not an expert in this, but wouldn't these uh, spirozoite be a suitable target for a vaccine? Um, yes, and in fact, the two vaccines uh, that I mentioned, the RTSS and R21 vaccines that were recently endorsed by the WHO, um, target the same protein on the sporozoite. Right. But, yep. they're, but they're not as effective? Um, they, they are not as effective as we would like them to be. Um, I, they're considered first-generation vaccines, and, and I think may, maybe to your point, Allison, <clears throat> What, what um, in addition to using monoclonal antibodies directly, they teach us something about what might be the important targets. And so, as I mentioned, the RTSS and R21 vaccines um, are a truncated form of this full-length CSP protein. 
And it turns out these antibodies are targeting an epitope that's not included in the vaccine. So second generation vaccines are now including uh, this, this epitope that um, monoclonal antibodies target. Yeah. Interesting. So let me open the floor to questions. There's a roaming microscope somewhere. Um, can we go over here? I have two questions. Number one, you didn't say anything about the nature of the antibody. I assume it's an IgG. Is it, is it complement binding or is it not complement binding? Yeah, good question. So it's an IgG1. It's a fully human IgG1 that was isolated from B cells of a, of a vaccinee. Um, the the preclinical data suggests that it that the vast majority of the activity is direct neutralization uh, without much of a contribution from FC effector function, whether it be complement or ADCC or other effector functions. Experience shows that it's very difficult to raise antibodies against conserved regions for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. So the vaccine story, what you say, fits into that. Yeah. But now since you know the conserved region. What about an mRNA uh, approach? Yeah, it's a great point. Um, as I said, um, next generation vaccines are including this region, and mRNA is, is one of the approaches that's being taken. So it's a great, great question. Um, Stefan Kaufman. Yeah. Uh, may I also ask on the implications for the future? Um, so first, do you expect this like a drug that is reinfection, which is frequent in children, would occur? And the second, do you financially, this looks like a traveler treatment approach rather than an approach for the people living in malaria endemic areas because of the cost? Do you have any ideas? Did you think about that for the future application? So these yeah. were two questions. Yeah, no, two very important questions. So the first question, this, this would be prophylaxis, not treatment. So the idea would be to give it to healthy individuals to prevent infection. Um, and yeah, our, um, the, the target population here are, are infants and children um, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and so to make this a viable uh, solution or product, it will have to be cost effective. Um, and the modeling suggests that at scale, uh, if we uh, succeed in optimizing the production of the antibody, let's just say at about $50 per US, uh, $50 US dollars per gram, we're, we're getting into the range, if, if we need about 150 milligrams for young children, so this is weight based, um, we're getting into the realm of the of the cost of the current uh, prevention measures for seasonal malaria in children, for example. The chemo prevention is, is about $5 per child uh, per year. Um, so this, this really is going to be the major challenge, is to um, produce this at scale in an affordable way. Um, but the optimistic prediction is that this will be possible. Travelers are important uh, as well, but our, our interest really is in, in where the greatest burden of disease is. So it's a great question. Just for <clears throat> curiosity, do you find such antibodies also in people living in these areas? And, and exactly the same kind of, of antibodies targeting the constant region? Uh, it's a great question. So as Allison said, we've been doing immunoepidemiology in this population for 15 years. And, uh, this is not a very immunogenic epitope uh, that these antibodies target, uh, which may explain in part its conserved uh, nature. And we really don't, if you, when we actually measure uh, concentrations of the antibody in, in the population uh, in Mali in the placebo group, there is no antibody. So we don't see these particular monoclonals um, coming through natural exposure, um, which is kind of, uh, uh, it, it's striking, it's interesting, it's maybe another whole discussion as to why that doesn't happen. But as I said, we're, we're, these antibodies were derived from uh, US volunteers immunized with uh, irradiated sporozoites. We're continuing to, to mine for more potent monoclonal antibodies in endemic, from B cells from individuals in endemic areas, and we think 
um, that after 30, 40, 50 years of intense exposure to sporozoites that we will find rare but very potent monoclonals that are highly mutated um, that target these uh, neutralizing epitopes. So, yeah, really good question. Do we have one last question? If not, can I ask you just a general question? Yep. What would make things go faster? Is it just amount to, uh, a question of money? Well, you may have heard that there have been malaria cases in the U.S. recently, a handful of cases. I think if malaria became a problem in wealthy countries, this would have been solved 20 years ago. So, yeah, it really is a question of uh, resources, I think equity, as you said earlier. Um, if, if we were to bring to bear our capacity and our technology that we've brought to bear on COVID-19, for example, I'm sure this would go much faster. So we're doing our best <laughs> with what we have. <laughs> but good question. So I see no more questions. So thank you, Peter. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. So now we're moving on. Now we're moving on to a non-communicable disease. And I'd like to welcome Mark Dewey to the platform. Mark is a physician at the Charité here in Berlin. And he's also, where he also studied medicine with a short stay at the John Hop Johns Hopkins. But he's dedicated the best part of his career so far to developing better testing for coronary artery disease, which is the worldwide the biggest killer. Um, and it's only um, exceeded in the very low income countries by, it's put into third place by neonatal diseases and lower respiratory infection diseases. So what we're talking about now is the biggest killer and important not only in the West, um, but also in the South and other areas of the globe. Thank you, Mark. Thanks very much, Alison. It's a great pleasure being here. And as you alluded to, uh, coronary artery disease is not only the most common cause of death worldwide, it just became, thanks to efforts you've been alluding to the last minute, the most common cause of the death in the global south as well. And what you do see here on the next slide, depicted by probably the most influential German uh, newspaper, the Daily Mirror, is coronary CT in Germany. One has to say that, that's just the translation of Tagesspiegel. And what you do see here is a CT volumetric image that encompasses 100 million voxels acquired within 200 milliseconds in an individual. And this provides to you a radiomics feature of the individual risk a patient will have for coronary artery disease. And the article that you do see here is specifically about the question whether CT will replace other more invasive tests such as cardiac catheterization, which at least in this country where we are world leaders, not in soccer anymore, but in cardiac catheterization, we do 1% of the population cardiac cath on every year. This 1% calculation includes neonates. So it's probably in the above 65%, 65 years population, it's a heavily overused test which doesn't show you, as you see here, the complete picture of how coronary artery disease actually does evolve. We've been working on this the last uh, two decades with technology partners, industry partners, to make this something that can be translated into clinical practice. So this is what a setup looks like. You do an EKG in patients, you trigger it, the image acquisition, and you can identify stenoses and coronary arteries now non-invasively and accurately by computed tomography. And not only that, CT can also reveal coronary artery plaques, the thing that forms in the arteries and actually leads to myocardial infarction and is the risk component, which cannot be seen by cardiac catheterization itself. Interestingly, as you see in this three-dimensional display, we also see the entire chest. So if people come with chest pain, it's not only all about the heart. It's commonly 
an origin outside of the heart. And with CT, we now have the ability to discover these extracardiac origins as well. So stenosis can now be visualized, non-invasively excluded or confirmed, leading to further therapy. This is what a setup on the CT scanner looks like. Patients get a little bit of an intravenous pharmaceutical to display the coronary arteries, and the test is rather quick. This sounds simple, but it's been a long story to make this test being able to do so the last two decades, as I said. We've been very fortunate that the discharge trial was selected by the European Commission for funding. We did the discharge trial together with partners in 18 European countries. That has been an enormous cultural learning experience for me personally, of course, because I witnessed all of these sites. I learned the differences in approaching science in these countries and centers. And I also learned that the economics differences within our continent are probably two to three times larger than the actually very discrepant situation we even see in the United States. So together with these partners, we randomly assigned, and that's the important methodological aspect, to do this for a diagnostic test. Randomly assigned more than 3,500 patients who showed up with suspected coronary artery disease and stable chest pain, not acute, stable chest pain. We randomly assigned them to either undergo CT, as you see on the left, or cardiac catheterization, which they were clinically indicated. So it wasn't something we made up for them. They actually had the clinical indication according to European guidelines. After we had randomly assigned patients, we then looked at patient-relevant outcomes after 3.5 years of follow-up. And the primary endpoint was something that is truly relevant to patients. It is whether you die from cardiovascular disease, it's whether you get a myocardial infarction or a stroke, so something that's really disabling you to have high quality of life. We did not include aspects such as whether you needed another testing or you needed you know, another hospitalization, as it's often done by industry-driven trials. This is very rigorous. We only looked at events that matter primarily to patients. Importantly, these events were looked at by independent blinded assessors who did not know from which randomization groups this report was from. Because, of course, we cannot blind patients, right? You can't tell them, oh, imagine this would be cardiac catheterization while you're getting a CT. This is really hard to assess. Anyhow, we also looked at patient reported outcomes, such as quality of life, angina, and importantly, as a safety event, major procedure-related complications, not from the testing, but from anything that followed. So not only from the CT itself, but if CT detected this patient would need cardiac surgery, then we included also any complications from cardiac surgery in this randomization group. Randomization was stratified not only for center, remember the economics differences we see on the continent, but also importantly for gender, so we have an equal distribution of women and men in the two randomization groups at all of the centers. When we started this journey, Hal Sachs, who I owe a lot to, said in this interview with the film crew, we did a video that was translated into all the 16 languages and was displayed at the centers to patients to help recruit. He said, Mark, this is a very challenging study to do, but one that I think is really important to try to do. Friends in the United States tried to do. They didn't succeed. This has political backgrounds I would prefer not to comment on. Now I have the pleasure to show you the main trial results. The main trial results were published in NEJM, so another thing we have in common. It was published as a lead article in the journal with an editorial, and importantly, it was published by the Discharge Trial Group. So that makes me emotional now. This is not authors, first authors. This is really a family which made it possible that after 3.5 years, so really long time, 
we had in 99% of patients outcomes data about the primary endpoint. So we knew whether they died and what was the reason. We knew whether they had an infarction or stroke in 99% of the patients. The journal also has a two minutes video, which I could have shown you and then left stage to explain the results to patients. But I want to guide you briefly through what the results were. So this is an inverted traffic light system. And for those from Germany, nothing from politics. Um, and this shows you coronary artery disease was depicted equally well by CT compared to cardiac catheterization. Non-obstructive coronary artery disease, so you know, whether you have plaques or not, was actually missed in cardiac catheterization. If you do the subtraction, it was missed in 14% of the patients who were in the cardiac catheterization group and leads probably to undertreatment in some of these patients. And that's the main outcome of the study, looking at cardiovascular death, MI, or stroke. And the hazard ratio kind of suggests that if at all there is an advantage of CT, uh, the result not being significant, and we're currently working with the discharge trial family on an extended follow-up, which goes till eight years in patients, because the curves actually separate quite convincingly, but not significantly. Most important for the HTA organizations in this country and beyond worldwide is the safety outcome. And remember, the major procedure-related complications included what happened during the subsequent treatment. And they were reduced in the CT group by a factor of four. So CT actually makes your treatment safer because patients were treated almost equally as aggressively in the CT group, but the treatment is individualized and reaches those who actually need it. So going now back from the NEGM publication, remember we did a gender stratified randomization. And that was probably the reason why our women results, the women and man comparison, was accepted by BMJ same year as the NEGM publication. And most important is this chart. The yellowish curve here is the cardiac catheterization women, and the yellowish curve down here is the CT curve for complications in the two randomization groups. The violet groups are the males. There isn't so much a difference in complications. There isn't that much of a reduction in complications in males. Remember, all these devices, they were tested, developed for treatment of coronary disease in men. And you see here, they are not made for women. NCT makes them safer. There's a reduction in complications in women by a factor of seven, while in the overall population, it's a factor of four, and it wasn't significant in men. There is many subsequent publications in leading cardiology and radiology journals that I'm not allowed to talk about, but which are in second revision already now. But I can show you, and this is really, really important because that's one of the high risk groups. I can show you, if it lets me, the results in patients living with diabetes. A very important risk group if you relate to people with coronary disease. And this is the main result. This is outcomes in people living with diabetes versus those without. And I will show you now what it is. This is people with diabetes in cardiac catheterization. You see a lot of events, 10% events over the follow-up. This is people living with diabetes in the CT group. And interestingly, the outcomes are similar to people without diabetes who get cardiac catheterization. So this is really a tremendous change in people living with diabetes. What has been the impact of the discharge trial so far? It's been selected by several journals as the paper of the year. It led to several additional articles. There's even articles saying now, what is the consideration post-discharge? That makes you all very, very happy and is really, really fun from an academic perspective. But the translation is only there if it's used in the clinic. And this is what the Tagesspiegel reported about, how we use this in the clinic. And this is the patient uh, who was reported on also in videos by Tagesspiegel. This is where you can see how she was examined and what we found in her. And CT will really soon replace other approaches to coronary artery disease. And let me briefly conclude. Um, CT is probably a very good alternative to cardiac catheterization in certain patients. 
we don't know much about those with very high risk of coronary artery disease. This needs another trial to convince CT is great there. CT reduces events, CT reduces procedure-related complications. Women benefit from less complications. Patients with diabetes benefit from less events if you do CT instead. It will certainly be used in the clinic. And the most important thing for me to see was that in the final HTA report of the organization that is advising GBA in this country, so the most important decision-making organization we have here, uh, has cited discharge a hundred times in its report. And this is where it gets emotional again, because this is a team's effort of my team at Charité. They saw this and they kind of said, all right, now we understand why we did this, right? And we'll soon see that GBA in this country and other HTA organizations worldwide will adopt this. And in this country, it's the first imaging-related new reimbursement since four decades. And that was really an important reason to work on this the last years. I do thank uh, my team at Charité. We work a lot, as this Charité Hightower also tells you on AI. You see the A and the I as marked in white on our tower, uh, which is really great fun to bring radiomics um, to the community, the medical imaging community. It's, it's really with whole heart to say thanks to our major funders, the European Commission, uh, the German Research Foundation at the Berlin Institute of Health at Charité. And a final personal uh, comment in the last uh, seconds that I have, as an East German, it needs people to tear down walls. They don't fall naturally. Thank you very much. Yeah, great, uh, great talk, Mark, thanks. Um, I'm not a cardiologist, but I, I, do, I do, do still see patients, and I'm just wondering if there's a role for uh, CT imaging in, in patients with sus, um, a suspected non-ST non elevation MI. So, I mean, you, you enrolled patients with stable coronary disease, coronary artery disease. I think if someone has an ST elevation MI, they clearly go to the cath lab immediately, but for, for patients presenting where it's not entirely clear, it could be um, you know, a non-ST elevation MI, do you see a role for imaging there? That's a great question. So it, it helps me advocating the third trial we are currently trying to propose to funders and we're collecting uh, with our little box uh, money. Um, in addition to those who are asymptomatic, remember 50% of the myocardial infarctions are in people who never had symptoms, right? I mean, this is heartbreaking. We're addressing those with symptoms, but we're missing out on those with you know, no symptoms before, they just die. And especially in the global south, people in Bangladesh, uh, they die in, in their third or second decade, right? And uh, we're not addressing that. Um, we don't address people with high risk, and we don't address people right now with acute chest pain. This is because there has been trials, and there are several methodological reasons why they failed. There have been trials in people with acute chest pain and non-ST elevation myocardial infarction who didn't show an advantage of CT. I think it needs, and they weren't multinational as we did in discharge. So I think it needs multinational efforts and it needs um, a different design in the trial setting to prove the added value of looking with radiomics at the whole coronary artery, at the coronary plaque, to better predict individually what patients with acute presentation actually need. Uh, but for this right now, there is no indication upcoming, but it's probably one of the most important questions we have right now in imaging. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Is there questions from the floor, please? One here, one here. Just for the money, how do the costs for both procedures compare? That's a great question. We recently showed the cost-effectiveness comparison of, at the European Shared Decision-Making Congress. So if you've been there, you were lucky because you, you had a glimpse, and it's currently under consideration by a journal. And, um, of course, CT is not as costly as invasive coronary angiography by cardiac catheterization. It can't be. But the question, of course, is you need a true cost effectiveness. Maybe you have more you know, testing in the CT group in the years to come, which adds on costs. Um, I can't tell you the details because <laughs> it's under consideration right now. But I think, in general, the future for CT looks bright. 
Um, and it's, it's, an, it's the second most important point, you know, following, of course, patients' rights, patients' access, and patients' outcomes. Mr. Yeah, there's a question at the back there. Yeah, thank you. That was a great um, talk. I was curious when you're doing the imaging, since you, you have a contrast to see the vessels, are you also collecting data on like LV geometry and function at the same time? Yes, it's all in the game. And, and this relates to an important point. Why do we do AI in our group, right? Everybody may have said, yeah, but this is obvious. You can read it as a radiologist, right? You are trained. Well, you can, and we train a lot of people. We have now 1,000 a, a trained radiologists in the country who can do that. But on average, it takes 30 minutes to read a case. It takes 200 milliseconds to acquire one of these volumes, but it, it takes 30 minutes on average. And especially looking at things that you mentioned, which are as important as the other aspects in the coronary arteries. And AI is going to help us in quantitatively assessing this and bringing this to clinical practice. One of, the, one of the dramatic findings I thought was that in the case of catheterization, you overlook 15% of plaques. How come? How is this possible? Well, this is not in order to blame the, the physicians reading these tests. Uh, remember, you're looking at a luminogram, right? You're looking at a display which only shows you um, the inner vessel part, it doesn't show you the plaque and the surrounding, unless you do additional invasive measurements based on cardiac catheterization, which you don't do in every patient where it looks baby clean coronary arteries. So the test itself does not give you a three-dimensional picture of the coronary arteries, the formations of atherosclerosis, and of course also not the things uh, that the lady asked in the previous question. Of course, cardiologists will look at that with the view of reimbursement. I mean, clinics of cardiology, uh, they use this methodology because it's very, the, the catheterization becomes very well reimbursed. How, how about CT? Well, it's with not. As I said, next year we'll start having this as a first new imaging reimbursement code in this country since four decades, and, and then we'll take off. And that's an important part, because we have to avoid overusing this technology um, as we've done with other tests in the past. And it's very important that the indication is jointly done interdisciplinary, uh, which a great advantage we have in this country is independent physicians from radiologists. So as, as a radiologist, I'm not allowed to pick you up from the street and say, want to get imaging with me? Uh, come join me. It has to be different physicians being involved in the clinical indications and those performing the testing. Uh, and that's a very, very important aspect to consider in that. Overall, and that uh, relates to your question, there are calculations that probably half a billion can be saved annually only in this country by replacing in those people where we have the evidence, not in all, cardiac catheterization by CT. Do we have further questions? Here's one. Thank you very much. So, what is the difference concerning the radiation of both procedures? That, that's a perfect question. I, I think in, in Table 5 of the 80-page appendix of the NEGM publication, uh, there's the information that it's both roughly 5 millisieverts, um, which is okay because it's kind of equal. Um, but we're still working on further reducing this uh, for CT, which is important. If we look at people who are asymptomatic, but come with high clinical risk factors, because then you want to do it with even less radiation dose. But I do think it's far less of an issue. When we started that, we often had exposures of 15 to 20 millisieverts. Um, I would also like a question myself, if I may interrupt. The, this is, the, the results on women versus men is quite extraordinary. And I wondered, what makes women so vulnerable to damage during this seat? So, so we haven't looked yet, and it's about to be analyzed and submitted, at the details of patient management differences that have, may have led to this. Um, an important aspect, which is in Table 11 of the appendix, I still remember that because I, I get this question a lot, uh, it shows you that the testing with CT makes your interventional procedures safer. 
So we had 10 non-fatal myocardial infarctions induced by cardiac catheterization treatment procedures in the cardiac catheterization group, and only one in the CT group. And those procedure-related complications that were associated with the treatment and cardiac catheterization in the catheterization group were almost all in women. And my theory there is, as I said during my talk, these devices were developed and tested in men. And we have to change our approach there. It needs a culture change. I mean, half of the population is women. And we still continue testing mainly in male studies. And this may have been the reason. Remember that in women, similar size and height as men, the coronary arteries are smaller. So the devices that are used are probably not gender sensitive. Yeah, that's... Um a lesson to us all, it happens a lot, I think, in clinical trials that uh, the gender differences are not taken into account. So this is fantastically on time, unless there's another question which will make it run over time. Was there? No? Good. So it remains just for me to thank very much the speakers. It's been both of them fantastic, interesting talks and very um, encouraging for the future. And um, I'm going to close the session with a reminder that in 10 minutes, the next session starts. So please do try to be punctual. Thank you.
Um, welcome back to the next session after the shortest two minute, 10 minute break that I incorrectly announced. So now we're going to do something a little bit different. We're not talking anymore with the winners themselves. We're, our next two speakers are young scientists. Um, and again, as in the first session, we've got one communicable disease and one non-communicable disease. And we're starting with the non-communicable. And it's going to be presented by Sophie Hoyer sitting here, who's a physician, scientist, and neurologist at the University Hospital in Heidelberg. And she's standing in for her colleague, Frank Winkler, Winkler who is actually the uh, Falling Walls Science winner in the life sciences this year. And Frank's work straddles the worlds of cancer and neuroscience, and it's really transformed the way um, brain tumors are treated these days. And Frank is unable to be with us because of a clashing appointment, um, but Sophie is going to tell us about an interesting new approach to understanding why glioma, which is the most common form of malignant brain tumour, is so resistant to therapy. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you very much. I'm very honored to be here and um, speak on behalf of um, the head of our research group, Frank Winkler. Um, first, I would like to start by um, introducing incurable gliomas, high-grade uh, gliomas, uh, a bit. Um, they are primary brain tumors, which means they originate from brain cells in patients. Um, they consist of glioblastoma, which is the most aggressive form but also other subforms, astrocytomas, grade two to four, midline gliomas, um, which have a specific mutation, K27M, and other, other um, subtypes of the disease. The treatment consists of surgery, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, but um, we sadly experience a high, high rate of recurrence, um, which makes these diseases incurable, and especially glioblastoma, um, very aggressive with a very dismal um, prognosis. Um, this is due to a diffuse brain colonization we have of the tumor cells in the brain. As you can see here from an autopsy um, sample, the black dots represent single tumor cells that invade all throughout the brain, even to the contralateral. So the other side of the um, brain, we can find single diffuse tumor cells. So a challenge is how can we effectively target these tumor cells in such an organ um, that is also so vulnerable to treatments and side effects? And is the brain itself involved in the malignancy? How does it, does it and how do, um, does it contribute to tumor growth? How does it communicate with the tumor? And um, how do tumor cells um, use neural mechanisms? How can we um, target uh, uh, therapeutically target them. And this is how the new um, research um, um, area, cancer neuroscience, um, developed. So when we use our um, mouse model where we implant human-derived um, glioblastoma cells, that's called a xenograft, into a mouse brain that we can observe uh, longitudinally over time, the mouse brain, we can see how single, single tumor cells depicted here in green really invade into the brain and, um, and colonize the brain until it really builds a dense tumor cell network that is also um, representative of the human disease, where we see these very long and thin um, membrane protrusions interconnecting tumor cells to this very dense network also in the human disease. We call them my tumor microtubes, and um, they, as you, as you saw, are really scanning the brain, connecting the um, tumor to a dense network, and they have similarities to neurodevelopment. So when neurons grow, they form neurites that really um, scan the brain and invade the brain, and we see similar proteins involved here in these um, malignant um, cells that colonize the brain. Furthermore, once the network is established, we can see that it is also a functional network. Um, as you can see on the lower right side, there's also calcium activity between the tumor cells 
um, um, ongoing and really these um, wave-like activities bursting out. So why is the network important for the tumor? Um, we can see that the tumor, um, tumor cells integrate to a network which makes it resistant to, uh, resistant to treatments. So if we have tumor cells that are non-connected, these will disappear under treatment, under radiotherapy, chemotherapy, under the therapeutic pressure. But um, the connected tumor cells will um, survive the treatment and they will connect even more densely. Um, this is also shown here from our mouse model where we can see the connected tumor cells build even more TMs and in integrate even more densely into the network while the single cells disappear over time and are not resisting the radiotherapy treatment. This can be overcome when we target the before mentioned neurodevelopmental proteins that are reactivated in these neurid-like tumor microtube processes. Um, we can expand the um, effects of our treatment. So we inhibit the possibility of the tumor to build the network and then we give radiotherapy and we see there's a bigger response to the treatment. As you can see here, we have the resistance I just showed you, why when we have a knockdown, so a lower expression of these proteins, we have a bigger effect of the, th of the radiotherapy treatment, as also shown here in an MRI study of the mice, and here shown the lower expression of the, tu of, of the tumor marker of the tumor microtube protein. We have a smaller tumor. Um, after radiotherapy treatment, so it causes vulnerability to the treatment. And with this, we can, we can establish a whole new concept of this, um, of this disease. We have the tumor microtubes that extend um, and scan the brain very um, mortally and, and cause um, invasion, proliferation, dissemination of new tumor cells, building of a network until it fully integrates to an entire tumor cell network that is connected between two cells with gap junctions, um, allowing the passing of um, small molecules um, and also um, communication factors such as calcium um, between these cells and causes the resistance. And as said before, we also have this um, communication in the network with calcium signals. So we were looking more into this, and this is um, work that was led by our um, very talented MD student, David Hausmann, who used our two photon in vivo mouse model, where he looked at calcium activity. So you can see the bright spikes here and showed that these connected tumor cells are not only um, sitting there in a, in a connected manner, but they are communicating in a very structured way. And this could be also reproduced in an in vitro assay, so where we culture the cells in a dish and we could show that even without the normal brain around, we could reproduce um, these calcium activities between the tumor cells. So it is also a tumor autonomous mechanism that is sufficient to, to be um, built by the tumor cells themselves, even without the input of the brain cells. And when we further look into single cells and really diving into what is going on between the cells, we can show that from one cell, a signal can be sent to other cells downstream over time and really have the cell, um, let's say cell, cell A first, followed by cell B, followed by cell C, and so on. And this is also rhythmic. It's the same in, in, vitro, um, um, in, in the in vitro setting. This rhythmic activity um, was um, um, caused by these single cells, as we can see here, one single cell that is really triggering the activity downstream in the further, in, in the further network. So we have a pacemaker-like situation coming from these very connected hub cells. And these concepts follow other concepts of graph theory of networks that are scale-free and small word properties, which means they are very effective in communicating and they're very resistant to random damage, pretty similar to um, how the internet is structured or other networks are functioning. So we have this very low number of um, these pacemaker-like cells that are triggering the calcium activity downstream. 
What we also found that the, a specific channel is triggering the calcium activity is the KCA 3.1 channel that is enriched specifically in these very few percent of the, of the um, pacemaking cells upstream in this whole communication cascade. And there's an inhibitor to the specific channel, which is called Seneca POC. That, was a, um, that is a um, drug that was tested already in a phase three study for a different disease in human patient, patients and showed a very good tolerability, a very good safety and a per, um, permeability of the blood-brain barrier to this drug. And if we give this drug now in this new context of inhibi inhibiting these pacemaker-like cells, inhibiting this driving of the tumor um, invasion, we can see that these mice develop smaller tumors over time in MRIs shown here, and um, also experience a longer survival um, after, be, after treatment with this drug over time. So, so with this, we have a new concept also, not only of this network, but also of the function of the network. We have um, these pacemaker-like cells that are um, driving the communication into the network. They also show similarities to neurodevelopmental um, um, programs that have, um, with the um, invasion of neural cells, um, some um, calcium communication too. They contribute to the resistance of the disease, resistance of random damage. Um, they are active, these networks are activated by these very connected pacemaker cells. And downstream in this whole network, they trigger protumorogenic cancer pathways in the entire tumor. Um, so these drive the progression even in the entire network but also offer new therapeutic vulnerabilities that specifically target these pacemaker-like cells in these very highly connected hub areas of the tumor with this inhibitor Seneca POC. So this offers new targeted therapy, therapies. So now we discussed many mechanisms of tumor intrinsic communication that works also by the tumor cells themselves. But furthermore, we also studied and this was led by Varun Venkata Ramani um, in our group, the interaction of neurons and cancer cells. And what he could find, and others did as well in this very nice back-to-back -back, um, study, that neurons of the non-malignant, of the healthy brain, connect via synapses to glioma cells, to tumor cells. And these tumor cells receive the input from the healthy neurons and this stimulates the tumor cells to proliferate, to invade, to build their network once more. This communication is triggered with the AMPA receptors, which are postsynaptic receptors sitting on the glioma cell, mostly on these tumor microtubes, these cell processes connecting tumor cells, and triggering the calcium activity within the tumor cell network again and driving malignancy. Luckily, also in clinical settings already used is an AMPA receptor inhibitor. So the receptor that sits on glioma cells and receives the input from neurons, driving the malignancy. And this, re uh, this inhibitor is called parampanel. It is already used in clinics in the setting of epilepsy. And when used in the context of glioma cells, seen again here in green, we can see that after parampanel treatment for 14 days, we have less proliferation of the tumor than with the control treatment um, and show a, 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 lower cell, a lower cell density of these two tumor models shown here and also in this back-to-back -back publication um, in pediatric glioma models, so a similar setting. Um, so these many mechanisms can be integrated into several functions of the tumors. We, we also um, looked at the invasion of the tumor cells that are um, replicating invasion mechanisms of neurons while they are um, building the brain. It's called neurogenesis. So in the time where neurons travel throughout the brain to build a cortex and to build your um, specific brain regions, this is reproduced by tumor cells with branching migration, locomotion, translocation, how the tumor cells invade. And this is once more also in the invasive part stimulated by neuron glioma synapses that drive the invasion. 
And with this, we have several new approaches how to potentially target this disease and really focus on the network activity, on the communication of the tumor cells. We are happy to um, start with the first um, study funded by the German Ministry for Education and Research, which is called PERSEARCH, where we will give the parampanel, the inhibitor of the synapses in a clinical setting to really measure the effectivity on um, the inhibition of tumor cell growth. Another study that has already found its way to clinical translation is the MacMath trial, also performed in Germany where MFA is given to patient, which is an inhibitor of gap junctions, also the connection point between tumor microtubes on um, cells. Furthermore, the Seneca POC, in, uh, which is inhibiting the specific channel on the pacemaker cells, is a very promising new um, agent and we have several other agents um, that are um, investigated currently for TM formation, specific inhibition of protein structures, and bringing something into this network um, in a more basic research setting. And with this, I would like to summarize. So we have these incurable gliomas that are highly aggressive, highly resistant, that hijack multiple neural, neurodevelopmental mechanisms, driving tumor growth into a tumor organism um, that colonizes the entire brain. We have this very resistant, resistant network that is driven by endogenous activation, periodic cells, and exogenous activation with the synapses, which cause intracellular calcium waves and causes tumor progression. We could find new therapies here that are inhibiting the network architecture, but we will have to make sure to preserve the brain function um, in this um, organ. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention, thank everyone who's involved in these very um, um, breaking wall um, studies, and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you, Sophie. That was a fantastic and sort of terrifying talk. And it's good to see so many different approaches coming in. I'm going to open it up for questions now. And I'll ask the first question, which was, what's, what do you think the selectivity is going to look like for these network drugs? The seal? The selectivity. So will they be safe? Will they be... Um, selective to just the, the brain tumor, or could they have problems in the brain or other parts of the body? Yes, um, as pointed out, this is always the question um, with any drugs that we try to develop for clinics, but especially also for neurology and um, for, for tumors. So, parampanel, for an example, the um, a synapse inhibitor, I will call it, um, is, is already approved in clinics, so it does show a good safety and tolerability profile um, um, for epilepsy. Um, but yes, the question will be how it, will it work in um, glioblastoma um, settings? We are giving it in a um, manner that is identical to how you would give it to epilepsy patients, so we also expect a good safety here. Um, for example, the Seneca POC, the inhibitor of the pacemaker-like cells, um, has been tested in a phase three study for sickle cell anemia and showed a good safety, a good tolerability, but wasn't tested in this con context, which of course um, um, eases our translation. Now it has been tested already in patients, so we will um, look at it from a different angle, but we are hopeful this, these are very um, um, easy to translate um, um, drugs. Anything else, of course, that you develop from a basic science to translation um, are more challenging to make sure to not um, um, interfere with normal brain function. Yeah, yeah thank you. So the, we have a question here at the front. Thank you, great talk and great work. I uh, have two questions. The first is the clinical trials, are they going to be monotherapy or are actually co-treating? Um, so the PERSEARCH uh, trial is a, a window of opportunity trial that will be given to patients with recurrent glioblastoma for which we currently do not have a standard treatment anymore. So patients are, went with diagnosis are treated with surgery, radiotherapy, chemotherapy and upon um, recurrence there's no 
um, validated standard anymore. So this is if resectable where this trial starts. And the treatment will be um, started with a phase of increasing dosing. And after 30 days, we will have a resection of the tumor, which also helps us for um, more informed research on, on the question of how, how effective the treatment is. We can look at the tumor tissue for accumulation of the drug and so on. And then um, we have a, thir a 30 days after surgery um, treatment phase, so in, in, in total 60 days with per surge. It's a phase two trial, so it's the first to establish effectivity. In this context, um, the surgery is not part of the trial, but it is part of the treatment for the patient. So yes, this is a monotherapy, although further treatment can be performed downstream, of course. And um, the, the MECMETH trial um, with the meclofenamate, the inhibitor of the communication points of the tumor cell networks, the gap junctions, is a co-treatment of um, uh, meclofenamate and um, timozolomide, which is a chemotherapy also um, used in recurrent tumors. And the rationale behind it is also what I pointed out in the beginning that you that that we saw um, and others too, um, the group in Bonn, that the disconnection of the tumor cells leads to higher vulnerability of um, um, cytotoxic treatments, so chemotherapy. And I think um, in, in many cancers, and especially here, we are not expecting to have one perfect drug um, treating it all, but rather um, several drugs combining um, um, from different angles that are helping us treat the tumor. That, that's what I would expect, that you actually here have the increased vulnerability, which is uh, really giving you a chance. The second question is, if I correct, recall it correctly, in, in, there are other tumors uh, outside the brain where metastasis is uh, driven by neurons, so, so they, they metastasize the cells along neurons. Can you elaborate a bit on that? So this is the rising field of cancer neuroscience, um, how, how neurons or the, the, the central nervous system, the peripheral nervous system interact with tumors. And we have, we have metastasis to the brain from, let's say, um, um, breast cancer to the brain. We are also looking how these cells then adapt to the brain and, and really infiltrate brain functions. But we, of course, also have tumors in, in different sides of the body that are not in the brain. So in the um, peripheral nervous system um, involvement is, is the new question we are also looking at. Um, and um, more and more evidence now that this becomes more of, of a topic to be studied shows that tumor, uh, tumor cells and um, nerves really interact and tumor cells, um, um, let's say, um, exploit um, trophic factors from nerves at least, or really um, also connect to nerves. But this is um, now the new field that we're studying more. We have a question at the back. <clears throat> uh, how does the age of the patients impact on the management and outcomes of the treatment? Um, it, it does. In, in general, um, for the first treatment, there are um, recommendations to, um, let's say, um, for example, um, for radiotherapy, you use, for younger patients below 65, you have a longer treatment course. For elderly patients, you um, prefer to do a shorter treatment course with higher radiation doses per day. Um, this has shown to be um, more tolerable for these patients. Um, sometimes the decision making is depending on molecular um, statuses of the tumor. Um, um, if you give these elderly patients chemotherapy or not, uh, weighing potential benefit with potential side effects. So this is something that is um, always weighed. For the studies we're doing, there's no formal age limit if you're above 18 years of age. So we, we have actually run out of time now. I'm sorry, I can see there's still more questions. <clears throat> but just before we wind up, can you just say one sentence about the epidemiology of these brain tumors, how do they manifest in, according to risk group and according to geographical location? So in Germany, and the same numbers reported from the US, um, in the incidence of, let's, of, of, for example, the glioblastoma, which is the most common primary brain tumor, most common glioma, um, is four to six out of 100,000, so this is the incidence, so four to six people out of 100,000 people become sick with this d disease per year. It's more of a um, 
less, it's, it's more of a rare or less common disease um, overall, but um, people are, are affected every year. We don't know why the tumor um, um, grows at this point yet, and um, similar numbers are reported from several countries. Um, um, the numbers are um, similar, yeah. Also in the global south. Well, I'm, I'm not sure if there's um, the same um, numbers acquired, but I haven't heard that there are less tumors there or less incidents um, as far as you can uh, report and measure. Okay, yeah. well, thanks very much. That's been very interesting. And um, now I would like to move on to welcome Doty Ochevac, who's going to be speaking us today um, as a Falling Walls Young Science Talent person. This is, this is an, an initiative from Falling Walls to award 20 winners of a competition to create a sort of network which um, promotes mentoring and helps them with their careers, etc. Um, Doty is a winner. Uh, she's going to, she's got a history of um, HIV studies. She got her PhD in medical virology from the University of KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa, where she studied HIV and immune escape. And then she moved recently to Stellenbosch University as a postdoc, where she's studying maternal HIV and CMV co-infection and its impact on fetal immunity. And today she's going to talk to us about her work on how HIV infection may increase risk of preterm childbirth. So thank you, Doty. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everyone. So uh, I'm Doty Ojoach from Stellenbosch University, so, and I'll be giving a talk on the placental immune cells and the impact of maternal HIV infection. So the HIV prevalence, specifically in South Africa, is uh, potentially in the childbearing females and in this uh, plot I'm showing you there. So we have the red are the females and the age range is between 20 to 39 and these are the, ch uh, the childbearing females and they have a higher prevalence of HIV compared to the men. However, the good news is that there's uh, immense uh, antiretroviral treatment coverage in this population, and we can see that about 90% are virally suppressed, and the ART coverage has really improved in South Africa. However, this also makes it complicated for these women because you have high prevalence of HIV, yes, you have you're properly uh, suppressed or treated, but these treatments come with adverse birth outcomes. So there are reports that have shown previously that these women will experience high risk of small for gestational age babies, stillbirth delivery, preterm delivery, and this incidence is very, very high in this population. Then this, their infants are not infected by HIV, but they are exposed to HIV in utero, and they are also exposed to the ART treatment. And these children are often not um, healthy, and they report various uh, clinical symptoms when they come to the hospital, like within the first year of life. It's not only specific to South Africa, it's also been reported in other African countries, but it's really a sub-Saharan HIV endemic uh, setting infection. So what are the mechanisms that lead to these adverse birth outcomes that led me to the interest of looking at the placenta? So here I'll just show a schematic of a pregnant woman who's uh, living with HIV and is taking antiretroviral therapy. What happens within the placenta that makes this child who is HIV exposed to have poor infant immunity compared to uh, uh, the uninfected infant, or rather the unexposed infant. And this has also been shown that they are more at risk of increased mortality. And studies have been shown in sub-Saharan settings, including Uganda, Zimbabwe, Botswana, and 
South Africa. So what can we learn from characterizing the placental immune cells within the placenta? So here I'm showing a schematic of, a pla of placenta and my, my focus for today will be on the, dis on the placental macrophages, which are the Hofbauer cells. So in this schematic, I'm showing on the outer layer, which is the maternal side of the placenta, we have the decidual macrophages. And from the fetal side of the placenta, we have the Hofbauer cells. There are various markers that have been used to describe these Hofbauer cells. And specifically, we have the CD163, the CD206, and the CD209. And for me, this morning, I want to claim that factor 13A1 is a key marker and is a a specific marker for Hofbauer cells. And how did I come to come about this factor 13A1? Uh, it's been described long time ago within the food industry. And what does it do in the dough? So this is a puff pastry with transglutaminase. And without transglutaminase, you can see that it's puffed up, like the croissant is puffed up when it has transglutaminase. And this is with control. And the factor 13 belongs to this transglutaminases family. However, in the body, they have different uh, functions, that, including hemostasis, coagulation, and embryo implantation. So I, having known that, that that is the function of the transglutaminases, I looked into the single cell RNA sequencing data sets of fetal maternal interface. and identified that factor 13 co-localized with uh, CSF1R, CD163, and CD68. These are markers that are specifically highlighting the myeloid cells within this fetal maternal interface. And in this uh, graph, I'm not able to delineate whether it's from the mother or it's from the fetus. So I took the next step forward to verify this expression from the in silico data on uh, placental tissue, and for this I utilized uh, the PIMS cohort, which is the prematurity immunology in mothers living with HIV and their infant studies. And in this cohort, we are able to recruit pregnant women who are both living with HIV and those without HIV, and who had different adverse birth outcomes. So when I tested for the factor 13 in this placental tissue, I uh, found out that the factor 13 co-localized with CSF1R, CD163, and CD68, and this is the merged image of it. And clearly, it shows that this factor 13A1 is a good marker of the Hofbauer cell, and this, uh, the immunoreactivity was highly present within the villus tissue. So to also delineate the different placental membranes and specifically highlight which section of the placenta is really predominant of these cells. So here I'm showing the different placental membranes. We have the decidua parietalis, which is very close to the mother, decidua basalis, which is a ridge between the mother and the fetus, and the villus tissue is the fetal side of the placenta. And the factor 13A1 positive cells were highly expressed within the fetal side, and this was consistent irrespective of disease status. So in the villus tissue, there's high expression of the higher density of these cells compared to the decidua parietalis, which is the maternal side. However, when I looked at the overall in my whole cohort of um, uninfected and infected placenta, there was decreased cell density of these factor 13 positive cells. So how was this translating to uh, adverse birth outcomes? So I still looked at different uh, birth outcomes within this, co within this uh, cohort. And in blue here, I'm showing the placenta that were collected from negative, HIV negative mothers who had term delivery. And in red is placenta collected from pregnant women living with HIV, those who experienced ad appropriate gestational age. These are just normal babies with appropriate age at birth, then those who had small for gestational age births, and those who experienced preterm birth. So for the preterm delivery, this factor 13 uh, cell density was lower compared to the HIV negative population. And what was striking and rather interesting was that in this population, those women who initiated treatment prior to conception had a lower density of these cells. So there's a significant reduction of this uh, factor 13 positive cells in the HIV positive, and it's even further reduced in women who initiated treatment prior 
to conception. What can we learn from the morphology of these cells within the Hofbauer. So I looked at the various parameters of the cells. These include the area, the perimeter, and the circularity. And looking at the area of uh, all the Hofbauer cells that were collected from preterm delivery, they had a lower area compared to those who had a term delivery. And this is I'm just showing a depiction of how it looks within the preterm placenta, so you can see that the areas are smaller compared to the, those who, exp who had a term delivery, or rather the HIV negative placenta. Then the, in terms of circularity, for the Hofbauer cells are more circular within the placenta that experienced preterm delivery compared to those who had term delivery. And looking at the relationship between circularity and area, we see that in preterm delivery, these cells occupy less area and are more circular compared to the term, uh, term pregnancy placenta or term ple pregnancy Hofbauer cells, which occupy a larger area and are less circular. However, there's a different mechanism for those uh, uh, placenta that had uh, experienced uh, small for gestational age, they have a higher area as well as higher circularity. And at the extreme end, I'm showing what I mean by uh, circularity. So you can see that the Hofbauer cells here, they are more spindle, they are occupy a large area and they are like they spread across the villus tissue. However, for preterm delivery, they are very, very circular and static. So could factor 13A1 be a possible predictor of preterm birth? Yes, we observed a good predictor for adverse birth outcome when I compared this with HIV positive and HIV negative. However, there was no prediction for small for gestational age and great prediction for preterm delivery. And to summarize, factor 13A1 is a novel marker for the Hofbauer cells and it's exclusively expressed within the villus tissue because we compared the maternal side and the fetal side of the placenta and there's reduced uh, density of these cells in HIV infected placenta and we have some significance in terms of the cell morphology in, in, of the Hofbauer cells and this could help us to alienate what really makes the cells is it that the factor 13 is produced as a paracrine effect extracted from these cells and does it affect the function of the Hofbauer cell? My hypothesis is that the low expression of this uh, factor 13 on placental macrophages may be uh, leading to poor implantation or angiogenesis and arterial formation of the placenta. I would like to thank my uh, collaborators as well as our funders and everybody who's been involved in this work. Thank you. Thank you, Doty. That was a real tour de force. A lot of data there and a very important area of research. Have you got any idea of um, the mechanism whereby this could be inducing I mean, it's a so, you've got this strong association, but have you got a, a mechanism that you're putting forward to how it all happens? Yeah, so uh, I've, or, um, I've looked at setting up functional assays downstream to just look at what really factor 13 does in terms of functionality of these cells. But factor 13 is, has also been described like in uh, pre-adipocytes, and there it shows that it really switch, acts like a switch for differentiation and proliferation of cells. So probably it does this, it has a similar mechanism in placenta, such that it makes the Hofbauer cells either to proliferate or differentiate, and this is hampered in preterm uh, scenarios where maybe the Hofbauer cell has not proliferated enough and therefore the functionality is hampered and the placenta is just not functional. It gives in before the nine months of time, yeah. So questions from the floor? Thank you. Very, very nice talk. Uh, can you just remind me um, about the incidence, let's say, of HIV-positive neonates, let's say, in a rural area, KwaZulu-Natal, North, or 
um, or somewhere Cape Town, uh, Stellenbosch. Mm. Oh, okay, so... In the current situation, the most recent, yeah, this HIV preventive treatment. In the, the current kids. situation, actually, I think South Africa has the best uh, vertical transmission prevention models at, as we speak, and it's maybe 0.1% or so. It's completely, completely eradicated, yeah. So the infants are not HIV infected, as I said earlier. The only problem is that they are not immunologically as stable as the, yeah. A question at the back there, please. Very nice talk. So I was wondering, since the transglutaminases are involved in like extracellular matrix cross-linking, have you looked at how in your different cohorts, like how the changes, how there might be changes in extracellular matrix across the, the different placentas? Yeah, I've only stained the immuno, immuno histochemically, oh. but have not tested the cross-linking or the transglutaminase activity or the factor 13 act cellular activity. But I'll do that, and I'm also looking forward to testing the peripheral blood for any other proxies that could highlight or that could be easily tested to predict or to give us an idea of what's happening while during gestation. I wonder if there may be changes in like mechanical properties from yeah. the matrix. Oh. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, do we have some more questions from the floor? So I would like to ask you, um, is there any sort of uh, difficulties or blocks in your work that you think if you had more money to do the work, things could be done more quickly or anything else that is standing in the way of, um, of moving forward quickly? Yeah, uh, of course the, 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 the establishing of these cohorts and just going around and participant recruitment, there's a lot of work and science communication or rather science uptake or research uptake that is needed. Over and beyond that, there's also the resource uh, limits in terms of do, uh, establishing placental um, functional assays because to just collect one placenta, process it and isolate cells from it is about 48 hours and it's, in, it's intense. So we need a lot of ex like expertise, personnel, finances, and yeah. But we do with what we have, yeah. yeah. Very good. So I mentioned that you were part of this network, the Falling Walls Initiative, the Science Talents. Could you tell us a little bit about how that, um, how people like yourself can profit from this sort of activity, what they do and and how much you've enjoyed it? Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm truly grateful for the Falling Walls. It's an establishment that offers uh, rather the soft skills, like how to, how to carry on with an academic career, particularly if you're an early career and uh, uh, other avenues or other options beyond the PhD if you're really not uh, keen on taking the academic career, but however, all in either way that you decide to choose your career path on how to flourish, how to communicate, how to write grants and compete for them as well, how to manage them, how to present, and yeah, I'm truly grateful. Fantastic. So let's um, close this session and thank both the speakers, Sophie and Doti, for very inspiring talks and wish them well in the future, because they've both uh, got the future ahead of them. And this time, I'm going to tell you what time you have to be back, which is at 11 o'clock, rather than risk giving you the wrong break time. So please be prompt, thank you.
welcome back to the next session. And in this session, we're going to move on to the next area of business, which is the breakthrough technologies in life sciences. And our first two speakers are going to talk about technologies applicable to regenerative medicine and to blindness. And so I'd like to welcome onto the stage Karen Christman and Peter Rolf Seymour. Thank you. And um, our first speaker is Karen. And Karen Christman is a bioengineer from UCSD. And as the terminology goes, she has broken the wall to cost effective, minimally invasive regenerative medicine. Uh, regenerative medicine is usually uh, a very expensive enterprise. It involves cells and living things. And Karen's approach has been to use biomaterials, which are both cheaper to make and to store and to move around. And she's developed an injectable gel which finds its own way to the site of injury and reduces tissue permeability and inflammation. It's a very interesting and novel approach. And she's going to talk to us about her research in applying this biomaterial in myocardial infarction. So thanks, Karen. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. And um, yeah, it's a, a pleasure to be here. Uh, so first, just quickly, my required disclosures. I am a co-founder of two companies, and I will talk about some of the work related to Ventrix Bio today. So as was mentioned, um, my focus is on myocardial infarction and heart failure, and I've been working on this for um, about two decades ago now. And so um, as you heard in the first session this morning, you know, obviously cardiovascular disease is a huge problem uh, across the world. And so my lab has been very interested in uh, designing uh, regenerative medi medicine strategies to treat the heart. And so I'm going to tell you today um, briefly about kind of our translational story in designing um, one of the early technologies in my lab to treat kind of the subacute to chronic uh, myocardial infarction patients and how that led us kind of down a road to actually even less invasive regenerative medicine strategies and now trying to treat more acute myocardial infarction patients. So uh, when, when I started my lab, we were very interested in designing, um, as was mentioned, biomaterial-based strategies to regenerative medicine. And so there are a few reasons for this. So one, kind of the, the standard regenerative medicine therapy, when you, I think when most people hear regenerative medicine, they think cell therapy. Um, and that has been explored extensively in the heart, both in preclinical models and clinical trials. Um, but it's extremely expensive. So um, in US dollars, an approximately equivalent for euro is, you know, tens or hundreds of thousand dollars per patient, um, depending on the type of cell therapy. But with biomaterials, you can do this um, with an order or two magnitude less. And so that's something we've been very interested in. Um, and also down, another downside of cell therapy is that you get very poor cell survival. So if you think about, um, which you don't have to worry about with an acellular biomaterial. So if you think about what you're injecting into the heart, um, if you're treating patients kind of in that subacute window weeks or months after their heart attack or out to years in, in chronic heart failure patients, what you're injecting into is something that looks like this, a very dense collagen scar. So acutely after a heart attack, you get upregulation of matrix metalloproteinases uh, and inflammation that degrades the natural cardiac extracellular matrix, and then it's replaced by this collagen scar. So when you're injecting cells into the heart, this is what you're injecting them to, um, a diseased microenvironment that displays both abnormal biophysical cues, but also abnormal biochemical cues. And so I think it's not so surprising um, that cells or say other growth or growth factor therapies that are including the body's own cells, this is what those cells are seeing. And so I think it's not too surprising that you know, it hasn't worked as well as originally intended. So our approach um, initially was to, instead of delivering a cell, inject a biomaterial scaffold that could recreate a more healthy microenvironment of the heart to encourage the body's own cells to see a more healthy extracellular matrix and promote healing uh, in uh, that wound, which is uh, a heart attack or myocardial infarction. And so the, one of the first technologies we developed in the lab was what we call our myocardial matrix hydrogel. So we, my lab actually works with synthetic polymers as well, but we decided to take a more natural approach here because it's really 
it's basically impossible to recreate the cardiac extracellular matrix synthetically because it's hundreds of components, both proteins as well as polysaccharides. So we took what nature gave us, which is a lot of pig hearts. Um, it's you know, easily uh, accessible byproduct of the food industry. Uh, and so what we decided to do was design an injectable cardiac extracellular matrix scaffold. So for those of you who might not be aware, there's a lot of work going on um, in tissue engineering and actual clinical products with decellularized, meaning strip out all the cells, leaving behind the extracellular matrix as a patch. And they're used clinically both in Europe and the US um, for surgeries, and they stimulate a pro-remodeling immune response as long as you de decellularize appropriately. You strip out the cells, leaving behind the extracellular matrix. So we wanted that to take that general idea, but have it cardiac specific and also be injectable so it could be delivered minimally invasively. And so what we do is we take pig hearts, we chop up them into small pieces, stir it around in a detergent to decellularize it and strip out all those cells. And you can see it leaves this kind of ghost white extracellular matrix. We dry it and mill it into a fine powder. And then we use an enzyme, pepsin, to partially enzymatic digest it to gain injectability since we wanted a minimally invasive therapy. Uh, so when you, uh, as long as you neutralize it or adjust to physiological salt and pH, when you inject this material back in um, the body into tissue, it reassembles back into a porous and fibrous scaffold that's very reminiscent of the original cardiac extracellular matrix, which you can see this inset here is this stage here before we've done this processing. And if you look at the, the biomaterial or the hydrogel, with a scanning electron microscope, you can see it forms this nice nanofibrous architecture, again, reminiscent of the original extracellular matrix. And so we optimized this basically digestion processing and concentration to enable catheter delivery. And so in the heart, uh, if you want to inject a biomaterial directly, but via catheter, you can use a transendocardial approach where you're accessing through the femoral artery, snaking up through the aorta, and then you have the end of the catheter inside the left ventricle with a needle at the end that can be deployed and retracted, and you can inject multiple times. So that seems simple, but actually with the delivering a material it is challenging because you can't have it gel inside the catheter. You know, you have to perform multiple injections without clogging it. So we kind of optimize this process to enable that delivery. And then we've done over, um, actually, more than a decade now, my lab has done a number of studies looking at what happens when you inject this material in, in preclinical models of myocardial infarction, both small and large animal, and I'll just give you a brief summary of that. But essentially, you, by creating this new microenvironment, you really do create a template for healing. So endogenous cells will migrate in, degrade the material, and replace it with host tissue. So what we find kind of the end result of stimulating that healing process is we get increased cardiac muscle through at least two mechanisms. One is decreases in cardiomyocyte apoptosis. And so we found that the material is actually a reactive oxygen species sink, which we think um, via the free thiol content which we think is helping to promote survival. But we also saw in the um, rodent models that we got significant increases in multiple cardiac transcription factors, as well as small but significant increases in cardiomyocyte proliferation. So we think we're, we see these larger areas of cardiac muscle, both in the rodent and pig models. Um, and we think it's through these two, kind of pro-survival as well as slight but small proliferation. Uh, we also see changes in cardi uh, cardiac metabolism, increases in blood vessels, so which helps with the ischemic environment, as well as decreases in scar tissue or fibrosis. So because of these studies, as well as a, um, functional studies in the preclinical models and a lot of safety studies, uh, Ventrix Bio um, completed a phase one clinical trial right before the, the pandemic started. Um, and this is what it looks like commercially. It's called VentureGel. It comes as a lyophilized cake. You add sterile water, and then you can inject it into, in the cath lab. So this was a phase one trial in 15 patients. Um, starting between about 60 days, patients were enrolled between 60 days after their heart attack out to three years, and were, they were all treated and then looked at at baseline and three and six months. So overall, um, demonstrated safety and feasibility, which just the safety of results alone were exciting because nobody had 
while I mentioned the decelerized extracellular matrix patches that have been used in our commercial products, nobody had delivered this kind of digested ECM hydrogel form of decelerized extracellular matrix in any tissue in the body. So showing initial safety in the heart was great because obviously the heart is a high risk organ. organ. Uh, but we also showed significant increases in uh, exercise tests, decreases in heart failure classification, uh, and then using MRI showed that 80 of percent of patients either maintained or decreased their left ventricular volume. So as the heart is going into heart failure, the left ventricle will dilate, so we want smaller uh, volume. So overall, uh, very promising, and we're actually about to start a new trial in uh, bypass grafting patients who can't have a region that can't be bypassed to stimulate neovascularization, and our collaborators at Emory um, in the U.S. are uh, just received approval from FDA to also test this material in hypoplastic left heart syndrome patients who um, are basically single um, ventricle patients who eventually undergo our right ventricular heart failure. But what I'll share with you for the, the rest of my talk today is how we're moving even less invasive, which also means uh, actually also more cost effective. So. Um, that catheter approach I showed you is great in terms of compared to, say, surgery, but it can't be delivered to acute patients because of the risk of arrhythmias, nothing to do with the material but just poking the heart with a needle. Um, and so we knew the material could be pro-survival, pro-vascularization. That would also be great. And ideally, you treat a patient as soon as possible after the heart attack to really prevent further damage. So a way you can deliver a material to the heart acutely is through uh, intracoronary infusion using the same uh, catheter that's used for angioplasty procedures. So after an angioplasty with the balloon, you can actually blow that balloon back up for few seconds, you know, 15, 30 seconds at a time, and through the same catheter, infuse a material. So the way it gets into the heart is uh, normally endothelial cells have these tight junctions, but in injury and inflammation, they become leaky. And so the idea initially was to design a material that could go through leaky blood vessels, concentrate in the infarct, and then perform similarly to what I, what I showed you with our original hydrogel. And so we re-kind of designed the formulation. This A through D is exactly what I showed you before. But in this case, we took this uh, liquid and uh, did high-speed centrifugation to remove the submicron particulate that would be too large to go through the leaky blood vessels, which you need about, if you look at nanoparticle literature, about 200 nanometers or less. Uh, and then you can still actually sterile filter it now, which is great, relyophilize it, and still be ready for easy um, rehydration injection. If you look at what that supernatant is, which, inform, which forms the infusible ECM, the yellow arrows here are pointing to this nanofibular architecture. The, the white arrows are just ice. So basically in that supernatant are kind of nanofibers of extracellular matrix. So we delivered this first in a rat model of MI using a simulated intracoronary infusion procedure. You can see here, this is one heart doing short axis cross sections. Uh, and where the labeled material is, is exactly where the infarct is. So we thought, great, the material works exactly how we thought it does. It goes through the leaky vasculature. However, uh, when this was, mostly done by my former PhD student, Marty Spang, when he finally got around to doing confocal imaging on it, we found it didn't actually work how we thought it to, originally did. So red is the material, green is are the endothelial cells, and just blue is nuclei. So what we found is that instead of going through the leaky vasculature, it actually bound to the gaps of the leaky vasculature, vasculature which I'll show you at the very end was actually even better than what we had originally intended. So we thought because, you know, if you, Imagine, you know, <clears throat> here's a blood vessel. These are, you know, cartoon version of our extracellular, our infusible extracellular matrix. If it's binding into those gaps, it should reduce vascular permeability, which is known to um, basically cause greater cell death and also um, allow for immune cells or inflammation to come in. So what we looked at to see if it was affecting vascular permeability, we did the uh, infusion of our material, and then we infused, this time, a fluorescently tagged BSA, uh, and then scanned the hearts. So here, if you look at a saline control, you see that the BSA is allowed to basically can extravasate through that leaky vasculature, and this is reduced with the um, infusible extracellular matrix. So almost immediately at 30 minutes after um, 
BSA infusion, uh, which was performed basically almost immediately after the infusible or the IECM infusion, you get decreases. So that's a physical blockage. That's not a biological effect. But at three days, you still see that decrease, and by then the material has largely degraded. So we think first it's physically blocking, and then after that it's basically accelerating vascular healing earlier than what would typically occur, which is about seven days the body would naturally uh, heal the vasculature. So we then performed uh, another study in, the, again, the RAT model of myocardial infarction using MRI to assess cardiac function. And within 24 hours after infusing the material, again via simulated intracoronary infusion, you got significant decreases in, in diastolic and in systolic volume. Remember, decreased volumes are better. Uh, trending increases in injection fraction, and that was uh, significant still five weeks later. So what we found when we looked at histology by, I think, kind of blocking part of those gaps between endothelial cells, we were able to reduce um, macrophage infiltration, so reduce inflammation. We, I think, secondarily then saw decreases in cardiomyositis apoptosis and then uh, increases in uh, neovascularization or the arterial density in the infarct. We've also recently done a lot of single nucleus RNA-seq um, post-treatment, and I think it, you can hopefully appreciate the differences between the material and saline groups on these UMAP plots. But just to give you a summary is that similar to other, other decelerized extracellular matrix materials, we find that the um, immune cells that are present are pro-remodeling, so kind of M2-type, Th2-type, uh, or M2-type macrophages and Th2-type T cells. Um, we get angiogenic phenotypes for endothelial cells as well as increased progenitors, and then cardiomyocytes have a pro-survival phenotype. So we've also done the more translational pig model where we can actually use the catheter that would be used in patients. And we similarly saw decreases in, uh, in diastolic and in systolic volume, you know, suggesting this has potential um, to go into uh, patients. And we recently got uh, a couple grants, one to my lab and one to um, Ventrix to uh, perform IND enabling studies to hopefully start a trial within the next couple years. Uh, so now we have a new type of infusible extracellular matrix material I showed you can now deliver it intravascularly. I showed you intracoronary delivery, reduces vascular leakage, accelerates vascular healing, it's immunomodulatory, and it's pro-survival. But as I said, that kind of accidental finding of blocking or attaching to the leaky vasculature you know, there's leaky vasculature in, in basically in all areas where there's inflammation, and this can affect many other diseases. So we think this can actually be done well beyond be used for things well beyond uh, myocardial infarction. And actually, we've also discovered that you can even deliver it uh, via intravenous infusion. Uh, and still will target the heart, but we've also shown uh, that you can target traumatic brain injury, pulmonary arterial hypertension, and even systemic inflammation. Um, and it goes to all the organs with inflammation, significantly dampens inflammation. And particularly in this model, we were about to submit a paper, we've shown um, quite uh, drastic uh, improvements in animal survival when you have severe inflammation. So we think it has really the potential to um, you know, basically break the wall to, you know, cost-effective, um, truly minimally invasive regenerative medicine. And with that, I'd uh, like to thank all the great members of my group, uh, current and former our clinical collaborators, as well as funding sources. So thank you. Thank you, Karen. Lovely talk. Um, just a small point, is this something that would be regulated as a medical technology or? Great question. So the original hydrogel um, is regulated as a biologic in the US, but B Farm has given it a device designation. The, because all the ECM patches are devices, the newer therapeutic, we're expecting a biologic in the US, and I'm not sure how Europe will handle it. It is a little bit different, the fact um, but it does create this physical blockage, which is, you know, a physical mechanism of action. So to be determined how Europe will handle that one. And what would you prefer? I mean, device has advantages in terms of, you know, more rapid translation into, or actually, you know, acceptance for a product, since you have to do um, smaller trials. So, you know, we would, 
it would be easier if it was a, a device. But there are some silver linings for biologics as well. Like you get exclusivity uh, upon approval, at least in the US, for um, I think, I forget how many years, about a decade or so. So, uh, but it's definitely more expensive to develop a biologic. Right. So let's open this up to questions. You wanted to say something, Peter? Yes, uh, that was very exciting. Um, new for me. <laughs> so, but you showed a lot of functional uh, improvements. But did you look also whether uh, heart cells, muscle cells, grow back to, into the lesion? So in this case, we're delivering them acutely, you know, basically at the time that they're dying. So what we see with the single nucleus RNA-seq, we're looking at that time point also acutely. What we see is more of a pro-survival. So we don't think that this therapeutic is necessarily going to grow new muscle, but the hope is that we can prevent more of those myocytes from dying. In the original hydrogel, we did see evidence of new myocytes. Uh, thanks. Really interesting. Um, so I, maybe I missed it, but I, is there evidence of increased contractility? So you mentioned that the ejection fraction didn't change, and I'm, I guess related to that, I'm wondering if in the phase one trial where you mentioned decreased left ventricular volumes, was there a change in ejection fraction? So for with the original hydrogel, we saw the main differences were in volumes um, versus, say, changes in ejection fraction. Although we did see improvements in regional contractility, we didn't look at that in patients, but in the pig study, we did see evidence of regional contractility. In the infusible extracellular matrix, I think we were underpowered there, so we did, you know, on average, ejection fraction was greater compared to, say, the previous hydrogel. I think we we're just slightly underpowered for ejection fraction. Uh, and there, and also in the pig study, we, we saw increases uh, or improvements in regional contractility as well, looking at echo. So I think it's particularly with the infusible that we, that we do anticipate in getting improvements in contractility by preventing myocytes from dying. Thank you. Have you started to combine this treatment with others? Uh, you mentioned the, the ROS sync function, so you could think of ferroptosis inhibitors, which are out there, or maybe even a cellular therapy. So not yet. We are very interested with the infusible to see if we can use it as a delivery vehicle as well. So it cl clearly has inherent biological properties, but we are now looking to see if we can conjugate. I don't think we'll conjugate anything large with it or include cells. We can definitely include cells with the hydrogel versions, and we've seen improvements in survival. But we are interested to see if we can uh, conjugate small molecules and, and more peptide therapeutics. Um, but stay tuned. So you mentioned that this could be used in a number of other disorders. What do you think would be top of the list? What's, what is the low-hanging fruit here? Uh, so right now, um, as I mentioned, we, the model for multi-organ dysfunction syndrome, which you know, basically goes along with things like sepsis or you know, even severe COVID. Um, and so that's something we're very interested in because the data there is like we see, you know, I think it was either 100 or 1,000 fold decreases in IL 6, for example, in the blood. We see decreases in the tissues, but really drastic decreases in inflammatory cytokines in the blood. So I think for these really sick patients in the ICU that, you know, have hyperinflammation, cytokine storm, um, the data so far in a mouse model, you know, looks really promising. So I think that would be the, probably the next target after myocardial infarction. Well, that's really fantastic. So thanks very much, Thank Karen. And we're going to move on now to Peter Rovsema, who is a neuroscientist who also deals in devices, but um, um, more of the prosthetic variety. He's a neuroscientist at the Netherlands Institute of Neuroscience in Amsterdam, and the wall that he's breaking down is blindness, right? Yes. yes. Um, so we go from the heart to the brain, <laughs> and I'm very proud to be here uh, as part of uh, the Falling Walls experience. So I'd like you uh, to, to learn about what we're doing in terms of uh, trying to create a visual prosthesis for blind people. And in the world, there are about 40 million people who are blind. Um, their numbers are increasing, especially in Europe. 
because of the aging population. And this shows you how information reaches the brain. So it's first projected onto the retina of the eye. Then there's this small nucleus that you see in the center in green that's called the LGN, lateral genic nucleus, which is a relay station that then projects the information onwards to the primary visual cortex, which is actually at, at the back of our brain. And um, if the eye malfunctions, then it's usually the eye bulb. So there are many diseases. It's a very fragile orga organ in some sense. So in previous work, we have now targeted the primary visual cortex as a place to interface with these nerve cells that are deprived of their visual input. How does this work? So we place electrodes. Oh, that sounds fancy. It's just wires. We place wires in the brain. And if you place a wire close to a nerve cell, as you see in this picture, and you stimulate, and you are in primary visual cortex, what you see here is an array of electrodes, 100 electrodes uh, on, on the plate. <clears throat> if you punch that into the brain, and you stimulate those brain cells artificially, even in people who are blind, so these cells are waiting for input, which is not coming. If you then artific artificially activate them, then the person, and can be a person who has been blind for several years, sees a dot of light. And we call that a phosphine. Now, the visual field, as we see it, is mapped in a very systematic ma manner onto the primary visual cortex, which basically has a map of space. So if you place your electrode in one position, the dot of light is going to appear at one particular location in the visual field. If you shift your stimulation location, the dot of light will also shift. So they're very systematic mapping, and that you can exploit. So if you place, say, 1,000 electrodes, or preferably even more, then you can create 1,000 phosphines, each with uh, its own unique position. And the idea, and it's not our idea that exists for, in the field for many years, is then to stimulate a pattern of electrodes. And you can then work with it like a, like a matrix board or a scoreboard that you know from the highway or from the stadium, right? So by switching on some light bulbs, you can just create pattern vision. And of course, it's clear that the more electrodes you have, the better, because you're going to increase the resolution of artificial vision. And a system, and, and there have been systems alike, would look like as follows. So the, the patients or the user is, is wearing a, a camera that can be embedded in glasses, something that you can just buy nowadays, and look at the street scene. Now, if you have 1,000 electrodes, this is too much information. You're not going to squeeze it into your prosthesis. So you have to simplify that. Well, for that, you can use artificial intelligence. So there are now very uh, sophisticated algorithms that allow you to kind of concentrate on the really relevant information. So here it's about vehicles if you're navigating a city, and then you're going to uh, have a wireless communication, something maybe on the back of the head that communicates wirelessly to a brain chip. That is then uh, connected to a stimulator and these um, electrodes, so high density electrodes that are really placed in between the nerve cells, so that requires surgery. And uh, hopefully then it works, and the patient will see what is out there. So we tested uh, proof of concept a few years back, and what we did is we placed 16 of these so-called Utah er electrode arrays. We had, each array had 64 of these electrodes, and we placed them in the brain of a monkey, and this is the work of Sing Chen, uh, who started now our own lab in Pittsburgh. And what you see there in the right, every black square is one of these electrode arrays. You're looking now from the back, so the, the non-pointy side. And they were still on a connector that was uh, screwed onto the skull of the monkey. And um, of course, in future versions, we would like to make this thing fully wireless, but we are not yet there, although the technology exists. OK, so this is how we placed these electrode arrays. So every square that you see here is one of these arrays. So they were placed in primary visual cortex. And then these animals were not blind. They could just see. So then you can see which part of the visual field you have to place a stimulus to activate these neurons. And this is shown in the upper left. So every color dot corresponds to one of these electrodes. And you see, for instance, that these, these red dots, they're in central vision. So in the bullseye, the center of the bullseye is central vision. 
And you see that these bluish uh, uh, dots, they belong to the electrodes that are kind of more to the center of, of the brain, that they are more in the periphery. Okay, so you see again this very nice mapping of visual space onto, onto the cortex. We replicated that in a second monkey. <clears throat> and now I hope the movie will work. So what you see here are all these green circles. These are the locations where we can create, create these phosphines, these rudimentary perceptions. And so if somebody can start up the movie for me. OK. So you see that the monkey is um, making eye movements. So the magenta dot is where he directs his gaze. He starts the trial by looking in the center of the screen where the cross is. And then we stimulate one of these electrodes. So the monkey is seeing a dot of light, and he, he's trying to make an eye movement there. So that works and also confirms that these perceptions are taking place at the, at the locations where you expect them. So this has been shown before. Maybe we're the first to be able to do this for hundreds of electrodes. Okay, now the big question for us was, if you stimulate more than one electrode, can this scoreboard analogy work? So can we create patterns that are recognizable? Now, to find that out, we trained the monkeys on a task in which they had to recognize letters. So here we present the letter D to them, and then there is a choice menu, and the monkey reports what he saw by making an eye movement to the corresponding letter. OK, these animals were seeing, so they were not blind. So they trained on this for many months. <clears throat> and then the exciting part of the experiment. We're not showing the sample letter. We're just replacing it by trying to paint a letter onto their visual brain. So here we try to paint the letter A and hope that the monkey will go to the corresponding letter. And if you can start a movie again. So what you see here is painting a letter, so here we paint the letter O, and yes, the monkey chooses the O from the choice menu. Here we're painting the letter L, and it worked. So we were so happy when this came out. We made a small dance in the lab. So this is proof of principle. This, this, this can really work in, in patients. That had not been shown before. Okay? <clears throat> so we think that, that it's time to test this uh, also in humans, because in humans you can just ask, you know, what do you see? which is very informative. So we work together with uh, Professor Eduardo Fernandez in Spain, who has a clinical trial and placing these same electrode arrays I was talking about in the visual brain of people who are blind. And this is Berna, Bernadetta Gomez. I can name her because she's quite famous in Spain now. She was the first patient to, to participate in this first in human trial. Um, and what you see here in the lower right is one of these uh, one, one of these implants, so it was, had only a single array with only 100 electrodes. And also the connector that was screwed onto her skull. <clears throat> this shows you where this electrode was implanted. So it's a four by four millimeter electrode. And that's actually quite small. You have to realize that the size of the map I was talking about is 25 square centimeters on the right and another 25 square centimeters on the left. So you're covering only a very small region of the primary visual cortex. But the first results were quite encouraging. So now they stimulated a set of electrodes in, in the shape of a larger square. And Bernadetta reported, I see a large O. And then the, when they only stimulated four adjacent electrodes, she reported seeing a small O. <clears throat> so that looks good. But it was not always as easy to understand. So here she reported seeing the letter I. And here she reported seeing the letter L. Now, I don't see an L there. So we think what's going on there is because, in her case, all the electrodes are on this small 4 by 4 square millimeter area, and you get some interference patterns. So if you stimulate two electrodes that are nearby, you might still also influence some of the neurons that, that are in the middle, which is not the case in our monkeys because there the uh, electrodes were distributed across a larger region of visual space. Can you start this movie as well? So this is Bernadetta reporting. Okay. 
final pues fue una explosión de alegría y todos ahí contentísimos. Pero por supuesto que si ahora hubiese uno que fuese inalámbrico, que se pudiera trabajar con mucho más electrodos y se pudiera ver más, yo ya no pido una, una visión, simplemente distinguir una puerta o un, un obstáculo, yo lo volvería a hacer así, sí, sin, sin duda alguna. Sí. Fue So. Thank you. So for, for me, she is, she's a hero, right? Because she is not expecting to get vision back. She just participates in this experiment where she's undergoing brain surgery. And her goal is not to regain vision, but actually to help science and also help future patients who might, in the end, also receive a prosthesis that is really functional and, and has more capabilities. And so these are also the, the limitations we are now kind of trying to solve. So what you see here on the lower left is the degree of visual field coverage. As I said, we are only covering four by four millimeters of, of a brain region that is 25 square centimeters, so covering less than 1%. <clears throat> and um, what you see on the right is the extent of a visual field. So it's 90 degrees left and right, and it's 70 degrees uh, up and down. And the red ellipse is what we are covering here. So she's not regaining vision uh, except in this 1% of her visual field. So that is something that we are actually working towards solving. And another problem, and here are the, the fibrotic cells. They're back. So they also, of course, are present in the brain. And if you have an implant that have stiff, stiff electrodes, then glia cells will build up and they will push away the neurons. So these electrode arrays are presumably only functional for a year, maybe two years, and then typically you, you get into trouble. Now, fortunately, there are new materials, so these very f soft and flexible electrodes that you can make. So we work together with a lab at Rice University where they make these electrodes hyper-thin and super flexible, and that seems to result in a much better longevity of the implant and hardly any fibrosis. So there are ways now to solve those problems. Now, in, in the last movie, if you can start at Nathan, I would like to also give you some realism. So if we can get this to work, it's not going to be as good as normal vision. And we can test this actually in, in normally seeing humans in virtual reality. So try to imagine what you see here. Do you see it? It's a person who's waving, right? So it's, it's not going to be comparable to normal vision. We don't give color back. We don't give depth, depth vision back. So there, there are many limitations. But if you ask people who are blind, at least a large percentage of them, it would definitely be better than being in the, in the eternal dark, so to say. And with that, I would like to thank my team. So Sing Chen and Fung Wang were really involved in, in the monkey study, demonstrating that you can recreate form vision with electrical stimulation. And the other people were uh, uh, yeah, involved in many other aspects. And Eduardo is the person leading the, the first in human trials. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, thanks so much, Peter. That's so impressive. I think we're all quite moved by that. Uh, you mentioned that 40,000, 40,000, 40 million? 40 million. 40 yeah. million people <clears throat> suffer blindness. What proportion of those would be suitable for this type of approach? Yeah, we, we have uh, looked into that. So we think that these types of treatments are quite involved and require some neurosurgical precision. So I think we probably are, will focus on, on those countries with a better health system then you have to think of people that have a sufficient health status to undergo surgery. You're actually now thinking of a form in which we can do uh, implantation through what is called keyhole surgery. That's comparable to what they do for deep brain stimulation. Of course, that increases the number of people that you could treat. Now, you don't want to treat people who are blind from birth because they don't have a fully developed visual system, so there is not an information processing stream that you could hook up to. So of all the people we're thinking now first about maybe one million who are eligible, and then we, we can see if, if this turns out to be a treatment, of course, how well it works. And I can imagine that then uh, 
It's the same with cochlear implants, right? So they were first very restrictive in, in applying cochlear implants. And then as the, the cochlear implant field matured and more, many more people kind of got experience with what it can and cannot do, then of course the indications can be more inclusive. So questions, I think Karen has a question. Yeah, very impressive you answer. I was gonna ask about the fibrotic capsula encapsulation, so you, you answered that question already. I was wondering if you could talk more about kind of, I guess, what techno technological advances do you think you need to be able to cover more of the field of vision in a, in a patient? So I, we were, we're working towards that. Um, so one a structure that is between the eye and the primary visual cortex is this LGN. I briefly mentioned it when I introduced the visual system. There you have the entire visual field, or actually hemifield, because there's one for, for the left hemifield and one from the right hemifield, um, with in a volume of about 120 cubic millimeters. So it's about six by six millimeters, or six by six by six millimeters. And, um, that is comparable to another structure that neurosurgeons are quite familiar in targeting, the so-called STN, uh, which is the target for Parkinson's disease. So I think there you have a good chance in, uh, with a, a single implant on the left and a single implant on the right to cover the entire visual field. And we're not the first to propose that. There's another researcher, Don Pizaris, who already kind of proposed this and demonstrated that you also get very nice and well-behaved phosphenes if you stimulate the LGN. We have a question at the front. Uh, it, it reminds me a bit on, on science fiction. I'm sure you know this character from, from Star Trek, Geordi uh, LaForge, with this thing called the, the Visa or whatever that was called. But if I remember correctly, he was able to not only uh, get vision, but also f others, other signals and stimuli were trans transmitted into his brain. I mean, are there any thoughts that in future you could also whatever temperature information, whatever comes from, from, from the sensor going to different parts of the brain? Is that kind of a vision as well? Yeah, so of course we have all kind of very powerful uh, tools. <laughs> so you can use yeah. your vision, look at your phone. Mm. And if you have a temperature sensor, maybe mm. hook it onto your phone <laughs> rather than onto your brain. That would be, would be my <laughs> advice. Maybe yeah, so these, these technologies are applied for people who are deaf. So you have the cochlear implant that they put it in the inner ear. And um, these, these work remarkably well for uh, specific tasks like speech recognition. People who have a cochlear implant, they cannot really appreciate music because the number of channels on the cochlear implant is functional channels is in the order of eight to 10. And the normal human ear has, I think, 16,000 hair cells. So there's a huge reduction of your coding space. And that's what we are going to experience also in the, in the visual prosthesis, of course. We have our human eye has one megapixel, one million fibers in the optic nerve that bring the information to the brain. We are replacing this now with 1,000. So it's, it's just never going to be as good as, as real. So. Um Talking of cochlear implants, one understands where the sensory information is coming in. Where is the sensory information going to come in when you're not actually tracing it yourself onto the um, electrodes there? Because there's no information coming through the eyes, is there? No, no, there, the patient has a camera and glasses. Oh, it's the camera, right? Yeah, yeah, and, and the camera and glasses, that, that was the picture of, uh, of the city I showed with the vehicles. And that, that camera image, you cannot just simply transfer that to the brain. So you have to hugely simplify it. But it's really, and that's also what you saw in the, in the movie with the person were wearing a VR, right? He's just looking around, the camera is pointing to different scenes. Now, another interesting aspect that, that may not be completely intuitive is that you might have to consider eye movements. So our eye, is always pointed at the part of the visual field that we're interested in. And um, so you could actually have a camera image, but the camera image will, of course, not move with the eyes, right? So then you can take maybe a wide field image and take the snapshot 
where the subject's eyes is looking at, and then magnify that and place then the part of the, of, of the image that, that is the one that the patient will be looking at with his or her eyes. So that's one other kind of way to, to take into consideration well, the, the, the eye movements that we, we normally make. And they are, of course, very important because we don't always realize it, but only central vision has this super resolution and the periphery of the visual field has actually quite a poor resolution. Yes, yes, so there are many cues to depth. One of them is uh, stereopsis, that is one eye sees a slightly different image than the other eye. And there are neurons in the primary visual cortex and also other brain areas that are exquisitely sensitive to the small disparities between the two eye images. That's going to be very difficult uh, because our resolution is simply not good enough to, to resolve those, those small differences in positions when seeing through the two eyes. But there are other cues. So if you, if you walk around, things occlude each other dynamically. Right, so a person who sits in front starts to occlude somebody for me when I move like this. And if you have sufficient number of phosphenes, you will definitely be able to take advantage of these other depth cues. Um, so there's another question here. This will have to be the last question. Thank you very much, really fascinating. Um, I was wondering, what is the intra-individual differences between human beings on that part of the cortex, on the spatial map? So is it comparable for many people, or is it, are there big differences? Yeah, so I mentioned two structures. I mentioned primary visual cortex, and there is a huge variability. So it has differences in size, maybe even double or triple. One person could have three times larger visual, primary visual cortex than another person. And then um, the place of primary visual cortex is also not ideal. <clears throat> so it's in the back of the brain, but it's largely between the two hemispheres and in a sulcus. So it's, it's super difficult to put these electrode arrays I was talking about there, because you would have to open up a sulcus. It's your brain groove, right? And there are vessels there, so the neurosurgeon is typically not very uh, uh, happy if he would have to, to open up a sulcus. Now, so that, is, that also is one of the reasons that we think that the LGN is a better target, because the LGN is very uh, reproducible and very comparable across individuals, and it's a nice sort of volumetric structure. Um, maybe you can think of it as a, as a coffee bean, something like that. And that, that is always the same across individuals. So that is, a, from that perspective, also a better target. Yes, fascinating. Thanks very much, Peter. That's quite extraordinary. And it just remains to say thank you for listening and come back again at 1 o'clock after lunch or after attending the plenary session, which I think is just starting in the main lecture hall. So thanks and see you later. <laughs>